Uh, fortunate today in having uh, uh, as our speaker, Professor uh, Scott Simon, uh, who will be uh, uh, considering the, uh, the native peoples of uh, Taiwan. Um, the, uh, I think this is, this is, this is uh, in, from, in my opinion, this subject is of uh, extraordinary significance for a variety of reasons. One, of course, is that uh, the native people of Taiwan are, are an inherently interesting subject, but also because that, the, that it is the native people of Taiwan who, interestingly enough, are, are making an important contribution to Taiwan's evolving identity. And, I, and, and this is something which is not necessarily uh, the case in, uh, in other uh, parts of, uh, of the world. And uh, Professor uh, Simon is the, uh, has the research chair in Taiwan Studies at the uh, University uh, of uh, Ottawa. Uh, he has a, uh, a distinguished uh, record of uh, publications uh, dealing with uh, both with the, uh, the uh, native peoples of Taiwan and, uh, and also with the, the people of Taiwan who traced their ancestry to uh, mainland China at one point or uh, uh, another. Uh, the, uh, again, we have had some exposure to the issue or the subject of the native people of Taiwan, but, but, but in the context of our earliest lectures dealing with uh, the, the situation before the arrival of the Dutch and then during the Dutch uh, uh, period, and, and a bit stretching into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, the German family's uh, domain. But, a lot, a lot of time passed between then and now, and the native peoples of Taiwan are still very much with us and with the people of Taiwan. And uh, having said that, I now want to turn to Professor, uh, 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 to Murray, uh, Professor Rubenstein, uh, and he want, he will, he will formally introduce uh, our speaker for today. Thank you. A couple of comments. Uh, Scott and I have hung out together in a variety of places. Uh, I discovered uh, how beautiful the University of Indiana's campus is. And then on the bus ride going to the airport, he said it was also, that whole region was also KKK territory, which was an interesting fact when we heard about the NCAA in Indiana, in Indianapolis, and it added to the flavor of that reality. I mean, I, I don't know if you wanted to know this, but it's out there. Our country sometimes is as strange as many, many others. We don't accept that fact. Uh, but thanks to Scott and the Andrew Lee, who you've heard, and a number of other peoples, while I'm formerly a historian, part of the Myron, of course, is very much an anthropologist. And Scott is one of those real people who lives in a number of worlds. His first work was on small, medium-sized enterprises. He looked at women in the workplace and then became something else, a student of the, of the Aborigines. And getting into that world in a very, very deep way. And some of you may have been at Columbia about a year or two ago when Hu Tai Lee showed her most recent movie. She's in her work capturing the, that world on film. And then Scott does it in a variety of ways. And I think there's a degree of advocacy as well that I, I think is part of what you do. And I think in many ways, it's pioneering work. There is work among missionary groups, particularly the Mary Nolans, who do teach the language, the Romanized form of various languages. This is done primarily in Taizhong at their chapter house. Uh, but this has become a major study. You go to Academia Sinica and you see it there and other places as well. And the film that Butai Lee did captures part of this mixed world of culture that they're part of. And Scott has also looked at this world in a variety of ways, learning the language, getting a sense of his people. One other little note, probably percentage-wise the most Christian of Taiwanese turns out to be Aborigine. I think the number is about half or so. You know, uh, that has worked very well. 
the missionaries have worked hard, Catholics in particular, primarily, again, Presbyterians. And this is an important part of the changing dimension. Their culture is rich in a variety of uh, ways. And uh, this is what uh, Scott has kind of told us over the years. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Gallen and Professor Rubenstein. I'm very honored to be invited here to give this talk. Um, I want to also thank uh, the ancestors of this land, because we are on Iroquois territory here. Um, I also want to thank my ancestors, in an intellectual sense, who worked in this building because, uh, uh, of course, this is the department of Boaz and Mead and Kramer and Benedict and so forth. So very, very important to us as anthropologists. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Tico, for supporting this class. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, I want to thank the Canadian Social Science and Humanities Research Council, which has sent me the time I want to do the research that this is based upon. And all of you, I'm very thankful that we're here and taking this class and being here together. Uh, some of you have perhaps remember the talk I gave here in 2011. It's already been four years. Um, I, please bear with me. There will be some basic material I'll have to go through again because for many students it's a new material. Um, but I will be updating things until uh, 2015, especially the political situation in Taiwan. Uh, there's an election coming up next year, uh, so I think that uh, there will be some interesting dynamics going on in Taiwan that are related to this. Um, so anyway, I'll go ahead and uh, what I want to do is kind of begin by sharing with you a bit of the context of indigenous rights. Um, first of all, just a couple of pictures here of contemporary Taiwan. On the left-hand side here, we've got a map of the indigenous groups in Taiwan with the 16 different groups. Uh, the last time I was here, there were 14 groups. So there has been that change since 2000. The two new groups were recognized. Uh, we'll discuss that a little bit uh, in a few moments. And then, of course, the picture on the right is President Ma Ying-jeou wearing his indigenous garb. Um, I think that it's, it, in, in one way, it looks a little bit silly that he's doing that. But on the other hand, I think that it really shows that there's a certain intention, at least, of reaching out to indigenous people in a way that we haven't seen our prime minister or president do on this continent. So it's quite interesting to see that indigeneity is a very much a part of the politics in Taiwan in a way that it is not in the United States or Canada. So as we move forward, I think I'll just you'll notice that the title says native, and yet I'm talking about indigenous peoples. So I wanted to say a few words about the word indigenous. Uh, which has become very important in international law and, and in, in ways that have replaced native in some ways. Uh, the term indigenous is derived from the Latin word indigena, which means born in a country or native. So in one sense, these two words can be used interchangeably. There are some things that they have in common. It came to mean born or produced naturally in a land or region, native or belonging naturally to the soil, region, etc. And it's for this reason that you often see the word indigenous used in regard to plants and animals in saying, for example, that the white birch is indigenous to New York State. In fact, as we're doing our research in indigenous studies, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but if you do a keyword search in your database at the library on indigenous, and you get articles about birds and plants as well as about human beings, and that's because of that dual meaning of the word indigenous. <laughs> Some people have thus resisted the imposition of the word indigenous to refer to peoples with specific rights. 
So there are people who do prefer alternatives like native, aboriginal, or first nations, which is a word that's used in Canada to refer to indigenous peoples. With others, like Mohawk political philosopher Taiaki Alfred, prefer to use local names, like Okwe Honwe. And so he finds it more liberating for indigenous peoples to use the word for human being in their own language. So in the area where I come from, some people like to use the Algonquin word Anishinaabe and refer to that. They don't. Alfred actually makes the argument that these other English words are a form of assimilation to the nation state and to some kind of an economic system that's been imposed upon them. And so they prefer to use their own words. But international law has coalesced around the term indigenous peoples. And many of these peoples have a long history of being studied by anthropologists. And some of anthropologists have become the experts in indigeneity uh, because of this long history. And as a matter of fact, anthropologists were very instrumental in bringing indigenous issues to the United Nations and other international fora. Um, Taiwan has been a part of this process, uh, actually pretty much since the beginning. And as the international community has changed its approach to indigeneity, Taiwan has likewise made a transition from using the word shanti shan pao, the mountain compatriots, to using words yen and yen indigenous people and indigenous peoples. So the debates that have happened internationally have been happening in Taiwan as well. And continue, there's still debates in Taiwan about what kind of rights indigenous peoples have. Now these aren't just word changes, these are very important. Uh, because when these words are written into law, and there's a choice of words that have to be made, they change the relationships between these groups and the state. And that becomes an object of inquiry in political and legal anthropology. Now much of this has happened in the UN system. Uh, the first part of the system to discuss this issue is the International Labor Organization, the ILO. Uh, which in Convention 107 on Indigenous and Tribal Populations uh, brought up the issues of indigenous rights, but in a sense of hoping that they would assimilate into the wider societies. Now the ILO is a very unique institution at the international level, in that they have not only state representatives at the table, but they also have union representatives. And what happened is that there were representatives from Latin America, especially, who were there, who, had, who were members of indigenous groups. And so they were among the first ones to bring indigenous issues to the ILO. Interestingly, the Republic of China signed this convention when it was still a member of the United Nations. I think it would be worth going to the uh, files someday, the archives someday at MOFA in Taipei, see what kinds of discussions were going on at that time. Now, at the ILO, this, of course, has changed. Indigenous peoples, over time, were disappointed with 107, believing that assimilation posed a threat to their cultures and ways of life. And so they replaced it with ILO 169 in 1989. And this document was special because it had an emphasis on inherent rights, and it brought up issues of land and so forth. So it gave more rights to indigenous peoples. And in many ways, that was a precursor to what came next. Uh, the Working Group on Indigenous Populations was formed in Geneva in 1982. Uh, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues was formed in New York in 2000. Uh, 1995 to 2004 was the first UN decade of the world's indigenous people. And then 2005 to 2014 was the second UN decade of the world's indigenous peoples. And you may notice that there is a very important change in the wording. There's a change toward using people, and most importantly, 
a change towards using the term peoples. Anybody know what difference it makes to talk about indigenous people or indigenous peoples? Yeah? Well, people meaning there's plural, there's more of them, more than one of them. There's plural in terms of groups. So if you're thinking about Taiwan, for example, we can say there are 500,000 indigenous people in Taiwan. And so when we're talking about indigenous people having certain rights, we're talking about having rights as citizens of the states that they're in. So we're talking about the rights to employment, the rights to education, uh, rights to vote, uh, rights to own property. Let me see. So it's the rights of individuals to become an indigenous people. If we're talking about indigenous peoples, on the other hand, we would say that there are 16 indigenous peoples in Taiwan. So we're really almost talking about indigenous nations in a way. And that these indigenous peoples would have rights as collectivities. And so they would have certain rights to have collective land of some kind, or some kind of self-government, um, some way of controlling their own economy, their own educational system, and so forth. And so that's a very big change from indigenous people to indigenous peoples. Uh, two decades of hard work at the UN finally culminated in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, which was voted in by the General Assembly in 2007. There were only four states who voted against that. Anybody know who four they were? The US. The US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. China voted for it saying that this declaration applies to North America and South America and they, they use what they call the seawater test and if it's a colonial power that has crossed seawater to then take over another place then this applies to them. So they're making the argument it does not apply to China which in their argument has no indigenous peoples um, in, including one of, they have ethnic minorities instead and the 55th is the, the Taiwan Tao Santu so they have their particular spin on that. Um, of course, crossing the Taiwan Straits is crossing salt water. <laughs> but, but anyway, the Chinese translated this declaration as uh, Their official positions, and there are no indigenous peoples in China, and they refer to Taiwan Of course, in 2007, the Republic of China was no longer in the UN and was unable to vote on that. Uh, it's quite interesting to note that the uh, Taiwanese groups do get to participate in many UN events. Um, they have gone to Geneva to the Human Rights Council. They do go to New York. Uh, they go to the permanent forum. There's a meeting that happens every May, and they go to that. Um, generally, there are two types of groups who end up going to these meetings. Uh, some of them have been led by legislators. Kong Wenqi is a rather frequent visitor to that. Um, also by social movement groups, uh, usually affiliated with the Presbyterian Church of Taiwan. And they get to go and attend some of the side meetings at these events. So, the uh, there has been an evolving definition of indigeneity. Uh, in one, ILO 169, uh, there's a discussion which is kind of a working definition of indigeneity. Uh, tribal peoples in independent countries whose social, cultural, and economic conditions distinguish them from other sections of the national community and whose status is regulated wholly or partially by their own customs or traditions or by special laws or regulations. Or B, peoples in independent countries who are regarded as indigenous on account of their descent from populations which inhabited the country or a geographical region to which the country belongs at the time of conquest or colonization or the establishment of present state boundaries and who, irrespective of their legal status, retain some or all of their own institutions. This kind of deals with some of the uh, this positions that some states such as China bring up. Uh, so for example, this second one here by trying to establish a present state boundaries, 
that opens up the possibility for groups that do not meet the saltwater criteria that China likes to talk about to be recognized as indigenous. Um, it also uh, opens up, the, irrespective of their legal status, so even if the state doesn't recognize them as indigenous, they can, if they wish to maintain their own institutions, claim indigenous status. And that's quite interesting in international law because there's a very major element of this, which is self-identification. Now, not every group wants to be indigenous. I think that there are good examples of groups that don't want to be indigenous for various reasons. Uh, uh, the Uyghur, a few years ago, actually, in their office in Washington, D.C., made a document saying that they are indigenous, and then China complained about that. Um, the Tibetans, on the other hand, seem to not wish to have an indigenous status, because that is a way of accepting the situation they have within a state. So, one working definition, which is often commonly cited in the works on indigeneity, is the Cobol definition, uh, which comes from a 1986 study of the problem of discrimination against indigenous populations. And basically, we can see from this definition that there are four elements that are explicitly in the definition. One of them is a historical continuity with pre-invasion and pre-colonial societies. Secondly, they consider themselves to be distinct from other sectors in society. Thirdly, they're non-dominant. And then fourthly, they're determined to preserve, develop, and transmit to future generations their ancestral territories and ethnic identity. Now, in addition to those four elements that are explicitly in that, there is, again, the uh, principle of self-identification. A few years ago, the poor of South Africa tried to claim they were indigenous and show up in these meetings, and it didn't work. It's not every group can claim indigenous status. I think that it's important to know these definitions. It does show quite clearly that the uh, indigenous, that the Yuzu Mitsu of Taiwan are indigenous peoples in the sense meant by international law. And in fact, Taiwan has recognized that, as well as mentioned. Um, and it's one of three Asian states who have explicitly recognized having uh, indigenous people. So it's Japan, Taiwan, Philippines. There are other states in Asia, such as Cambodia, that have used the word in certain forms of legislation. Uh, but Japan, the Philippines, and Taiwan have really written it into the full national law, including in the Constitution, in the case of Taiwan. So, I think we have to keep in mind that most of all, indigeneity is a relationship with the state. So it has to do with law, it has to do with states, and what kind of relationship do people want to have with that state. So it's somewhat like citizenship or immigration status. It's a relationship. It's not a thing or an essence of um, something related to internal and cultural values or so forth. It's, really is a relationship that we're studying here. There's a great diversity of local and national relations of indigeneity, as scholars working in different parts of the world show how groups manage to gain indigenous status in certain areas or not. Uh, Anna Singer notably uses the metaphor of friction to show how some groups claim to be indigenous when they have friction in the sense of conflicts with the state. But then there's also the use of friction in the sense that they can gain some traction by using this word, which opens up international networks for them and gives them some political capital as they negotiate deals with the encapsulated states. So I've, for over a decade now, I've been doing research on this. One thing that's changed since the last time I was here is I published a book um, about the relationship between indigenous people in the state in Taiwan, uh, looking very much at an ethnography of the peoples who have become the Dorogu and Sejek groups in Taiwan. Now, since the University of Ottawa is a bilingual university and we teach in French, I decided to write uh, my first book about them in French, and I plan to publish soon, I hope, a book in English. 
well. So um, basically, this is called Sejik Bala. I have many states of Formosan indigeneity. Sejik Bala, the Dr. Ni Formosan, and tous ces états. And the idiot works a little bit better in French than in English. Um, but anyway, this is the book I've written. So basically, when we look at Taiwan, we're looking at some Austronesian groups. And the Taiwanese indigenous groups have a very special place within Austronesia as a whole. Um, in fact, you can see that the Austronesians go as far south as New Zealand, as far east as Eastern Ireland, and even as far west as Madagascar, the Malagasy. So we've got where Boris Block was done his research. And of course, the Maori in New Zealand, uh, the Chamorro in Guam, Hawaiians, etc., are all Austronesians. There are approximately 380 million Austronesians, so it does represent a very large linguistic family. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the linguists consider that of the 10 branches of Austronesian languages, nine of them are in Taiwan. One of them represents everybody else. Uh, this great diversity of languages in Taiwan suggests to them that they must have been on Taiwan longer than anywhere else. And that's one of the pieces of evidence that is made to show that the Austronesians probably originated in Taiwan. It's the out of Taiwan hypothesis that uh, Peter Bellwood has been uh, very famously promoting. Their settlement on Taiwan dates back at least 6,000 years. Um, it may be the origin of Austronesia, but within Taiwan as well, there's great diversity, um, culturally and linguistically. In fact, the two articles that I suggested you read uh, do show that diversity. As we see in the north, we've got some societies that are very egalitarian. In the south, we've got a ranked society of the Paiwan tribe, which divides the society into nobility and commoners. Uh, so there is quite a bit of diversity on Taiwan itself. These 500,000 people in Taiwan are all economically and politically marginalized in relation to the Han majority. But if we look at their traditional territory, it's still half of Taiwan. So they are very important in terms of, not numerically, but in terms of the percentage of the territory that they claim. Amidst this diversity, Taiwan has now 16 indigenous tribes. I put the word tribes there in quotation marks. It's uh, sometimes seen as a pejorative word that anthropologists have thrown around as if a tribe is somehow a lower level of political evolution than states. Um, I put it in tribe, and the tribes in quotation marks, and I keep the word because the Taiwanese government keeps that word. And so I think it's important to use it there. It is in the official English language translations, which is the website of the Indigenous Peoples Council. And in spite of the questions about the word itself, I, I do keep it there. And I think that it shows that they are still subordinate to a state. And they don't have yet the political consciousness of nationhood which some of the First Nations in Canada have, and the Indian nations in the United States, and so forth. So it's not quite the same level of political consciousness there. At least not yet, and since it's not there, I think I'm going to use tribes rather than nations. Now, the study of this group is still very much in its infancy. Um, as we look at publications in anthropology, there occasionally there have been some articles. There was a big gap from the 1970s to the 2000s when there were no books published in English language, in English in Western languages, in English, French, German, and so forth. Um, before 1945, there were a number of articles that came up. Some Japanese anthropologists were published in American journals. But actually, most of the research has been happening in Chinese and Japanese. Uh, in Taiwan, of course. Interestingly, it's Japan which seems to have the largest number of specialists in anthropology working on indigenous issues. And ever since the colonial period, 
Uh, Japan has an association of the study of indigenous Taiwan as well as a journal. Scott, before we move on, your map does not, it seems, include the Mianyards, the Rade, and the Rai of Vietnam. Uh huh. Who, by George Condominas, uh -huh. always been considered Australian. Mm -hmm. well, am I reading it right? Or? Yeah, you're reading that right. So I'm, apparently Anderson doesn't count them as being Australian. So probably the boundaries here are a bit contested. Yeah. Yeah. It's unambiguous about that. Yeah. Not in this room, but in this building. Yeah. So yeah, most maps that I've seen have not had it, but you, know, you suggest that I read this book and then make that suggestion. So, um, so there are other populations of Austronesian peoples that are not here. <coughs> um, Malaysia is on the map, it's been definitely. It's quite interesting that Austronesians have, you know, state forms too. It's not everybody that's living in the mountains somewhere, but there are members of all religions, some are Christians and some are Muslims, and many of them still have the animistic beliefs. So boundaries are contested. Wolfert, is there still the need for a pass to go into, or a reservation pass to go into Aborigine territory? I remember I had to oh, more. yeah, you used to have to have a mountain yeah, pass. Yeah, mountain pass yeah. There are still mountain passes. The, the boundary tends to be moving up the mountains. So if you wish to go into some of the more difficult paths, then it's important to do that mountain pass. So the Aborigines are part of the 16 groups? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So the 16 and, groups, yeah. I mean, are there just, I mean, are there like two or three Aborigines, you would say, or they, they're Aborigines and the indigenous and the 16 are the same. Are you putting it that way? Yeah, the 16 groups are all indigenous peoples. Right. But as Aborigines. Yeah, we can use the word interchangeable. Okay. Um, some countries, well, some people don't like to use the word Aborigine because it's so closely associated with Australia. Uh, when we get to the case of Canada, the state actually uses the word Aboriginal to refer to. First Nations, which are Indians, it's the old word is Indians, are still the Indian Act, and the Métis and the Inuit. But collectively, they're called Aboriginal. And I think that Canada likes to use the word Aboriginal domestically in order to distance themselves a bit from the UN Declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. But they do use the word indigenous for other countries. So they tend to be uh, mentioned only in passing in oceanic studies. Every now and then, there'll be a little sentence somewhere at the beginning saying that the ancestors of such and such a people probably came from Taiwan. They're usually neglected in more sinologically oriented studies of Taiwan. So quite often you see that there was a village, and in the past there, was, there were battles with the Han and the Aboriginal people. And, and then it moves on and tells a different story. So I think that there's still a lot of room for new studies to be happening with these groups in Taiwan. And uh, obviously the Taiwanese anthropologists are best positioned to do that. Now one thing I try to do in my work is to really think about a genealogy of state indigenous relations. To show how this began, look at it in a historical context. And we can see that the indigenous groups were entirely stateless until the 17th century. So they didn't have the institutions of statehood in any sense. Not even what the Qing dynasty had or of any kind of having you know, a permanent government or a ruling class and so forth. It was the Dutch were the first ones. They were in Taiwan from 1624 to 1662. They were the first to enter into formal political relations with Austronesian communities on Taiwan. Uh, Tonio Andrade has a very good historical, two very good historic books now, uh, looking at this and showing it how the Dutch came in and they had these rituals in which they established formal relations with different indigenous groups. Um, they sometimes made alliances with weaker groups 
which enabled them to then fight more hostile groups. Uh, the idea was to uh, pacify the peoples living here in the southwest part of Taiwan, around what is now Tainan. Uh, then, of course, there was Koshinga, Chen Xiangdong, who uh, kicked the Dutch out. And uh, the Qing Dynasty then kicked out Chen Xiangdong in 1683. And until 1895, it gradually took over the west coast of Taiwan. It's kind of interesting. If you look at Chinese maps at the time, some of them actually only show the west part. And then the east part was just white. And this one, you've got the, west, the, the part in white is the Chinese part. Uh, but the Qing Dynasty basically categorized Austronesians on the island as the Shoufan or the Shangfan, the uh, cooked versus the raw savages, it basically was whether or not they had, if they surrendered to the Qing forces and become politically integrated into the Qing dynasty. Yes? Well, you know, the white part is like where there used to be Aboriginal groups there, but they don't exist, or do they are yeah, not recognized by the government? This white part here are the Aboriginal groups who, during the Qing dynasty, surrendered. So they became Shofa, the cooked savages. Now, what happened after they surrendered? Well, some of them didn't want to be a part of the Qing dynasty. So some of them fled up into the mountains. Some of them made their way around the coast up to here, to Hualien. Some of them stayed behind. And a particularly interesting phenomenon was that the Han settlers were mostly men. So quite a number of them actually married Aboriginal women. And so most of the Taiwanese people today have some kind of an Austronesian ancestry. So anyway, they, this area that's white was in part, became part of the Qing lines. They, Qing basically left the others um, to their own means. To their own means. They uh, basically had the attitude of governing them by leaving them strictly alone. Um, and in fact, they had barriers uh, along the boundary uh, in order to keep the Chinese out of indigenous territory, but also to try to prevent headhunting raids from the, the tribal people. And many of the people manning those barriers were, in fact, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Shangfa. Yeah, the, the, the Shofa. I mean, the Shofa. Yeah. 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 And so they also had the role, uh, the, the shofan, of trading with the people in the mountains. So, so they had very important roles as intermediaries. And those are the groups now, such as the Shiraya and Taina, who are trying to get recognition. So some of them are still around. Now, the Qing was quite content with leaving all of these areas here um, outside of the control of the Chinese state until the Mudan incident of 1871. Uh, basically, what, there was a very important incident uh, with which there was a second incident of its type. This time it was a, a ship from Okinawa that shipwrecked very far down in the south here in what is now Pingdong. And the, they shipwrecked there in a typhoon. There were survivors. And some of the survivors were killed in the village of Mudan. And this is what became known as the Mudan incident. And then others escaped. And Japan asked the Qing court to take responsibility for the incident and make reparation to the Japanese government. And the initial response from the Qing court was to say, this incident happened outside of China, and it happened among these savage peoples we have no way of controlling. And so there were discussions about this in international legal circles. Uh, there was an American who was advising the Japanese, another one advising the Qing, and so forth. Uh, but in 1874, the Japanese launched the Taiwan expedition. They sent military troops to uh, Bhutan to put down the Taiwan people. 
The Qing Dynasty realized that they were very much in danger of losing the east coast of Taiwan to Japan. And, and it was a strategically important to them. So in 1875, they declared that Taiwan belongs to China. Um, didn't take very long, however, until the Japanese got Taiwan anyway. Uh, 1895, of course, was the Treaty of Shimonoseki at the conclusion of the Sino-Japanese War. And so the Japanese took possession of Taiwan. Now, the Qing had never subdued these mountain tribes. In fact, uh, there's, there's quite a good book, unfortunately it's in German, but about this, but uh, they, the Qing dynasty did try to send a military, and they tended to lose the battles against the Yatayam. Um, it was the Japanese period, it was the first time that modern nation states subdued the mountain tribes and really incorporated them into the institutions of the state. So this is when we have military officials in these communities. We've got police, we have clinics, we have schools, and so forth. You know, post office and Wuxia and so forth. It became a part of a modern state. Now, the Japanese had their American advisor, his name Davidson. Um, and he gave them some advice about the frontier policies that the United States had. And so basically, the Japanese had several different sources of information that they could put their policy together from. There was the Japanese experience in the Hokkaido. There was what the Qing had been doing along the frontiers here. But then there's also the American experience. And so they established tribal councils in which they required every indigenous community to have a chief and a tribal council. Uh, they also created reserve land. In Japanese, that's the Banjin Shoyoshi. And this basically laid the institutional framework for the governance of indigeneity, as well as for the identities. In fact, the, the Japanese ethnographers uh, came up with a list of the different groups, and then the state administrators took that and decided to categorize them as nine groups. And basically, uh, those were the nine indigenous peoples in Taiwan for a very long time. So that's kind of a genealogy of things. If we look at the uh, indigenous state relations in the Japanese period, I think this trip, this photo here is rather representative. It's a group of leaders from all over Taiwan that were taken to Taihoku, which is the, old, the Japanese name for Taipei. And we've got the Japanese up on top, and then indigenous people below them, which is very similar to what their political status was at the time. The Japanese had all of the organized these trips to Taipei, but also to Japan for indigenous leaders so they could give them the impression that the Japanese were very modern and that they are blessed somehow by Japanese colonialism. Of course, in 1945, uh, at the conclusion of World War II, uh, Taiwan was transferred to ROC administration. And so then, a new dynamic was beginning to happen. There were new expectations from the state. And one of them, of course, was the introduction of representative political bodies. And I think that it's quite important to show what was happening in the period from 1945 to 1990. It's something that very few scholars talk about. It often seems as if indigenous peoples emerged somehow in the democratization of the 90s, but actually there were things going on beforehand that were building up from Japanese precedents. But there's a quite important thing to show this. Uh, in 1949, the first indigenous representative was elected to the provincial assembly. It was a member of the Atayal group. Uh, it's quite interesting that at this very early moment, there was talk about autonomy for indigenous peoples. Now, one of the main proponents of indigenous autonomy was Gao Yisheng, who had the idea that all of the indigenous groups in Taiwan could form one indigenous autonomous region, and then have a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the ROC. Uh, unfortunately, he was involved uh, with uh, Xie Shui Hao, 
in the uh, 228 incident and involved in attacking the airport in Jai, and so he was uh, executed. Um, but that was one of the first discussions of indigenous autonomy from the indigenous people. He was uh, he became a politician first. So 1950, uh, the ROC created 30 mountain townships uh, using the principle of local autonomy. If you go back and read some of the documents at the time, they all begin with a discussion of the three principles of the people and how it's important to give these ethnic minorities autonomy. So the word autonomy was already there. In 1951, a quota was established in the Provincial Assembly for two mountain and one plains representative. So they basically made a distinction between Plains tribes. So the Plains tribes are not the ones on the west coast, it was in white on that map, but rather among those mountain tribes that were on the east side, those that were more to the plains and did not have reserve land became the Plains peoples. Those who had the uh, reserve land during the Japanese period were the mountain peoples. So that's when we get Gao San and we get Sandi and Pindi. Gao San, so it's quite complicated. Uh, 1952 to 1962, there were campaigns to improve the lives of the mountain people. Uh, people in the villages still like to talk about what happened during that time. Uh, sometimes rather resentful at policies that required them to use bowls and chopsticks and tables, uh, to redecorate their homes so that there would be kitchens and toilets inside their homes. Uh, some of them will have told me that they initially found it disgusting that they would have toilets inside their homes. Um, and in fact, some of them put their toilets outside the home anyway, in the courtyard somewhere. Uh, these campaigns will led to the displacement of some indigenous communities. Many of them had already been moved by the Japanese. And there was a great movement into the cities at this time. So you had urban aborigines going to cities to work, uh, and so forth. In 1962, the ROC signed ILO 107. In 1966, there was a legal change, which, from the indigenous perspective, was probably one of the most historical moments. And that was a reform in the reserve land system. In that, whereas under the Japanese period, each community had its collective land, this land reform was a land to the tiller reform not too much unlike the land of the tiller reform that they know of non-indigenous groups. But indigenous people who were using a plot of land for agriculture had the right to go to the township office and register it in their names. And because there was concern at the township level that people could claim other people's land, uh, they had a process in which they had to put their land claim on a, the township bulletin board. And then if anybody uh, disputed it, then there were dispute mechanisms, but otherwise it became theirs. Now, as it happened, there were cases in which uh, some people, especially some illiterate or elderly people, lost their land because other members of their communities registered that land and so there's still quite a bit of resentment in the communities about that. Um, furthermore, the government opened up non-indigenous investment, in which companies that wanted to gain access to this land could apply for permission through the township office. And if the township approved, as which happened with Asia Cement, uh, then those, they could lease the land for a certain amount of time. Uh, this caused about 31% of the uh, mountain compatriots to lose their land by 1985. So there was quite a bit of land loss and people leaving the communities. During this time, indigenous affairs were administered by the provincial government. And there was a quota for indigenous representation in the provincial legislature. So I think it's a bit of an exaggeration to say that the framework for indigeneity is a result of democratization. There was already a, net, a, a framework that was already in place. 
And these were legal precedents that were very important later on. So the quota at the provincial level paved the way for having the quota for legislators at the national level. So in the 1980s, of course, at the end of martial law, this talk of the democratization of Taiwan. Uh, this was when we have the birth of the autonomous indigenous social movement. And it basically began in the networks of the Presbyterian Church of Taiwan. And so the first group was called the Alliance of Taiwanese Aborigines. In 1991, constitutional reform permitted direct elections for the legislative unit and created a quota for indigenous legislators. There were six at the time. So three for the mountain groups and three for the plain groups. It was changed to eight in 1997 and back down to six in 2005. Now in 2009, there was one indigenous legislator for every 82,500 people, as compared to one Han legislator for every 210,757. So we can see that the indigenous people, in comparison to their to their uh, percentage of the population are better represented in the National Legislative UN than are non-Indigenous people. Uh, I think that's partially because they're compensating for other types of injustices. In 1994, the word Yen was added to the ROC Constitution. And since I think most people in this room read Chinese. I can go ahead and put up the next slide in which we can actually look at the Constitution. Um, that was a very important change. In 1996, there was the creation of the Indigenous Peoples Council. Back then, it was called the Aboriginal Peoples Council. So the website is still apc.gov.tw. They've changed the word to Indigenous. And then, in 1997, Yuanzu Minzu was added to the Constitution. The difference between Yuanzu Min and Yuanzu Minzu is like adding the S in English. So, here we have the ROC Constitution. Uh, these are the additional amendment clauses that were added. Um, so basically, in 1994, we can see but it's important here that it's indigenous people. So basically what they're saying is that indigenous people have certain political rights, rights to political participation, and they should be protected. And this would include education, culture, social welfare, economics and so forth. But here, we're talking about the rights of individual people. <coughs> I think that clearly this is not entirely related to indigenous rights because of the very last sentence here. The people of Jinman and Mazu have the same rights. Because these are people in Fujian province, basically. Now, in 1997, there was another change. The wording gets changed quite a bit here. So that the state should, in accordance with the will of the people, so you already have peoples in here. So they're protecting indigenous peoples' status and political participation and all of these rights. But by using this word people and also using they're saying in this constitutional revision here that these peoples have rights. So the assumption here then is that the Atayal and the Amis and so forth will have rights to some kind of autonomy. Of course, Taiwanese legal scholars, including indigenous people with law degrees, are debating this. Uh, many of the people who actually promoted it have told me that they think that maybe those Han legislators didn't really know what they were getting into when they put this into the additional article. Uh, which makes sense because, again, we have people of Jinman and Manzo who have these same rights, and those are clearly not indigenous peoples. So we have the RLC constitution. But I think that the consensus is forming that 
in the Constitution, indigenous peoples have a rights to political participation as peoples. And so that's where the debates about autonomy are happening. Now that's the 1990s. What happened in 2000? A turning point in Taiwan. Anybody wake up here? Albion. Huh? Yeah, Albion was elected. I think that was a big surprise for everybody, including Albion, that he was elected in 2000. And of course, this has its uh, implications for indigenous rights. One of them was in 1999, while he was still a candidate for the presidency, Chen Shui Bin made a visit to Orchid Island, where he was surrounded by indigenous activists, including some of my good friends, like Wan Dan Jiro for the Sejek tribe, a not yet recognized tribe, and Igo Shiban from the Taroko tribe, which is also not recognized. And they asked him to sign a new partnership agreement, which included that there would be indigenous autonomous zones created. Some of those people uh, who were present and asked him to sign that also make, as a joke, they make the suggestion that he probably didn't understand what he was signing either. But he signed it because he wanted to make a campaign promise and get some votes from indigenous people. But he signed it, and the indigenous activists were hoping that this would be considered like a nation-to-nation -nation treaty. Uh, in fact, then in the year 2004, the Indigenous Peoples Council had discussions on how to include indigenous rights into the Taiwanese constitution. Not the ROC constitution, but the Taiwan constitution. So they had these weekly meetings in which they very serious, the documentation was quite large, studied such things as the Royal Proclamation of 1767 in North America, the Assembly of First Nations in Canada, the Marble Decision in Australia, etc. They were studying all of these indigenous issues elsewhere. I was present at these meetings. Uh, in many ways, that was my education, the beginning of indigenous rights in many parts of the world. So in 2004 as well, the Taroko became recognized as a tribe. So it's the Mali, that's one of the groups that I work with. Uh, in 2005, uh, the legislative UN passed the Basic Law on Indigenous Peoples. Now, it's quite interesting that this law passed at all. It was proposed by the Executive UN, Indigenous Peoples Council. And of course, the Executive UN was controlled by the DPP. But the KMT was still in charge of the legislative year. And so there was quite difficult for the presidency and the executive to get anything through the legislature. But they did. They managed to get this passed. Uh, it had a very unusual article at the very end. It said that it has a very, it's, a, it's a law which requires the state to recognize many different indigenous rights. And it says that all of the relevant laws and regulations must be revised and according to those principles before 2008. And so at the time, there was quite a bit of cynicism in indigenous communities. And people would say, well, 2008, we don't know what happens with this law. Will it expire in 2008? What if they haven't made the changes that are necessary? And of course, everybody knows that 2008 will be an election year. So there was quite a bit of cynicism about the law. In 2007, the General Assembly of the UN passed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, the Indigenous Peoples Council in Taipei declared the Taiwanese law already fulfills all of the provisions of, of UNDRIP. So I'm quite optimistic about that. Of course, the revisions to laws haven't been done yet. In 2008, the Sejek tribe was recognized as the 14th official tribe. So that was one of the last things that happened in the Abian administration. Now, indigeneity in the mire. First of all, we have to give credit to President Mai Joe because in spite of the fact that basic law said that it Everything has to be done by 2000. 
spite of the fact that the work hadn't been done, he has continued to work on this and to revise laws in accordance with the basic law. Now, he was elected in 2008, he was re-elected in 2012, with very enthusiastic support of the indigenous people. In fact, if we go back and I've done this look at the election results, that the percentage of indigenous people who voted for Ma is much higher than in Taiwan as a whole. That being said, he was very cautious about the issue of indigenous autonomy. Now, in Taiwan, all of the political parties at the national level have to have some kind of a white paper or a policy document on what they want to do on indigenous issues. And which is very different in North America, where it's usually not considered to be an important issue. But mind you, policy paper in 2008 said that in principle, he agrees with the idea of indigenous autonomy but that it has to be done on a one-by-one -one basis and on an experimental basis. So the idea being that one group would have an autonomous government first and see how it works. Uh, so he was quite cautious about the idea of autonomy. Which I, I guess that makes sense because there were still debates about what autonomy would mean. It wasn't even sure if the indigenous people would support it. But he did continue making other legal reforms, uh, such as regarding possession of firearms. And that's very important to indigenous people who like to hunt. And in fact, the basic law says that indigenous people have the right to hunt. And so there were subsequent legal reforms to make the law and regulations conform to the basic law. Probably the most important change that happened during the mob presidency was that indigenous legal hearing chambers began on September 3rd, 2014. Now, these are basically sections of the courts in which the judges are required to take into consideration customary law. Now, for the Atayal groups, Sejek and Tarokol, that means Gaia, which is their ancestral or sacred law, and it has to do with relations to land and to animals and so forth, uh, sharing with members of their community. And so now these courts are required to take customary law into consideration. Uh, it's still too early to know what the result of that will be. But it is already having some effect on the way that decisions are made. So recently there was a court case in which some hunters were taken to court on charges of poaching and hunting endangered animals, and they were declared to be not guilty because it's their culture to hunt. Yes? In Alaska, we seem to have similar kinds of uh -huh. tribal councils, and the Aboriginal people have a variety of hunting rights, uh -huh. but others don't have. We got is that, was that a model for it? Was it to see what is going on here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is somewhat of a model. I think Canada was more explicitly a model yeah. because the basic law basically says that indigenous people have the right to hunt for cultural and subsistence reasons, but they can't do it for profit. And that's basically what the Canadian case is. So, of course, there are issues there as well because some of them might legitimately want to sell meat for a profit. Um, but anyway, this is an interesting advance that was made in indigenous rights in 2014. So just last year, we'll, we'll see what's happening with that. Discussions continue about how to legislate indigenous autonomy. This is certainly the most difficult one. Uh, the basic law says that they have a right to create autonomous self-governments, but none of the groups have, even within their own leadership, any form of consensus on what that should be. The more progressive ones would really like to see a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, in which, for example, the Sejek would have their tribal council, which would have a nation-to-nation -nation relation with the ROC. Uh, they hope that they could maybe have something like the Assembly of First Nations, which from a First Nations perspective is a state-to-state -state relationship. From, of course, from a, the position of the Canadian government, that's not what it is, it's an NGO. 
but they're hoping that they can move towards some kind of a nation-to-nation -nation relation. That's the more progressive side. More conservative forces, and they also include indigenous supporters, want autonomy to be a strengthening of the existing township structure with very little change, actually. No change in the boundaries, uh, no change in the leadership system, no change to the rights of indigenous people, of, of non-indigenous peoples. So another change in 2014 was that the Hala Alua and Kanakanavu, who were formerly part of the Zo tribe, were recognized as autonomous tribes. So I'm going to go a little bit more quickly now. I think you've all read uh, two articles quite complementary to one another. My article in American Ethnologists and Hu Kwan Wei's article in Pacific Affairs. And basically, we can take a look at the electoral system as a place in which indigenous people gain the voice. And so basically, uh, I'm looking at the deals that are made between certain politicians and the state, and the politicians and the parties that they're in. And looking at these as many deals, also looking at the goal, the role of the uh, Tawaka, which are the uh, supporters who go out and mobilize votes, and certain rituals that happen, in which we can see that the indigenous peoples really do get to mobilize their cultural themes and cultural understandings of political power within a modern state. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Um, since I wrote that article, there have been some interesting changes. Um, so I don't know if you remember a whole lot from the article. You may remember that there was a certain politician named Tajiro in there. And uh, he was put in prison for corruption after that. Jiang, um, who was who lost a local election for village head in the article, in the most recent elections, was in fact elected as village head. And he did in fact do it on a clean practice of not distributing alcohol or feasting or anything. It was a clean election and it worked. And he was the official KMT candidate. It's a very interesting change there uh, since the last election. So anyway, since 2008, I think that there have been a few changes in the goals and strategies of the indigenous rights movement. Until 2008, I think the goal was on name recognition, getting recognized as tribes. Also the goal of autonomy. Here we have Sejek people swearing allegiance to the tribe of the Sejek. Um, actually, the outstretched hand that made some of the Sejek people uncomfortable. They, uh, one of them said it reminded him of Hitler. I think that the, the, it was not just the movement, just the idea of the nation and of, of belonging to that really made some people feel uncomfortable. So, so the states moved forward in 2013. Uh, Premier uh, Zhang Yinhua promised that there would be relevant policies concerning enhancing indigenous self-administration, boosting the development of specialized indigenous industries, and promoting ethnocultural pluralism. I think it's interesting to look at the faces in the photo. I know they're far away, you probably don't know them. But many of these same people, you see them on the streets at protests, and then you also see them inside the uh, executive yet. Um, this year, March 1st, uh, there was a new law that came out as a result of the basic law, the regulations for implementing the Protection Act for the traditional intellectual creations of indigenous peoples. Uh, when I saw the headlines in the news saying, new law protecting indigenous culture, I was quite happy. I thought, well, maybe this is protecting hunting culture and so forth. And it was more about patents and copyrights and so I want dances and songs and how to copyright them and make CDs and DVDs. And so it's kind of, I think the goal of the government is more to integrate them into the neoliberal economy and it's uh, a change that's going on right now. There has been, in the social movement, a shift to livelihood issues. So here we have in Tongwen, in Hualien, uh, a group of people protesting uh, 
very much about the, uh, the destruction of the environment and about the uh, Chinese tourists who come in in buses and they park outside the village and walk through the village to see some natural sites, but they don't spend any money in the village. All they leave behind is garbage. There are some cases in Shoni Township, which is where my, basically my privileged site of research, Asia's Cement. Uh, in October 2012, the Duruku won a 40-year land dispute with the cement company. The landowners were compensated. Um, but in Tongman, we had a road blockade in December 2013 because uh, protesting forestry division cutting of trees. And in 2014, they had a road blockade as well because of the tourism issue. In Taitong, uh, just to give another example, uh, there's the uh, Meiliwan Hotel. Uh, in 2004, Taitong County had, without getting the consent of the indigenous peoples, uh, which is called for the 2007 law, of course it wasn't 2007 yet, uh, 2005, I'm sorry, one year before the basic law. Um, but anyway, the Taitong County signed a contract with the Miramar Resort Village to build a hotel complex there. Local residents were evicted. Uh, then, of course, the basic law came through in 2005. And so they sued the government in 2014. 14 plaintiffs won on a ruling to revoke the environmental impact assessment. So they celebrated the victory, but it's unclear if construction is just temporarily halted or if they'll stop it entirely. Uh, there have been issues of nuclear waste. I think everybody knows that Orchid Island has uh, nuclear waste stored there. Uh, there, are, there is a proposal to store nuclear waste at Nantian Village in, in Taitong. Uh, the local village has given its approval to that. They've taken compensation. But it's right on a river, and the people on the opposite side of the river uh, are protesting that. Of course, hunting remains an issue. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that the indigenous movement is keeping up with changes in technology. So it seems as if all of these indigenous groups have their Facebook page. And so this is the Sejeka National Assembly, who's on Facebook. Uh, they're also very active on YouTube. Uh, any of you in your free time, you can get on Google and look up these groups. The Hunter, the Hunter Smoke Action League is, has been doing national protests on 228. They like bonfires, so that there's a movement in every single Aboriginal village. Uh, this year, they demanded that the ROC apologize. So they want them to follow the example of Canada and Australia to apologize for the treatment of indigenous peoples in the past. They want a fuller implementation of the basic law. And eventually they want a new multinational constitution for Taiwan. And I think that What's probably going to be most interesting in 2016 is that they've created the First Nations Party. It was established in December 2012. I was there, I took that picture. Uh, with about 250 people who are officially registered as members of the party. Uh, from the Thal tribe of Sun Moon Lake, Shi uh, Qinglong is party chairman. In the 2014 elections, they had six candidates. And three of them were elected. So Shi Qinglong uh, won by one vote in Nantou. Uh, Yang Shiguang won a seat, a Namese person, on the Taitong Shanbong Shanbong Suan, on the Township Council. And the Budon Shu Tzu Si won as district head in Namashan district of Kaohsiung. And they do have plans to have uh, candidates for the legislative year in 2016. So we'll see if they can mobilize the support at a national level. I think it was quite interesting to know that at the meeting in which they formally established the party in 2012, that there were members of and elected representatives from the KMT and the DPP were both there in support of that. They were, of course, indigenous politicians. So it's kind of interesting to see that they're creating a really a, a voice from the south, a platform which is independent of the other parties. 
So in conclusion, the Austronesians have been on Taiwan since at least 6,000 years. Over those 6,000 years, they lived quite well with their own political forms, ranging from egalitarian societies to ranked societies. They all lived on hunting and swinging agriculture. It was the Chinese and the Japanese who brought new state forms and forced them to integrate into modern nation states, which they've done quite well. Uh, the path dependency of history made them into indigenous tribes, uh, quite similar in some ways to North America. Uh, from a state perspective, that was done to give the state access to resources. Uh, I think that in the Japanese period, it was camphor and hinoki that attracted them there. And right now, it's tea and uh, tourism and so forth. But from an indigenous perspective, this was and is a colonial imposition. Democratization has given local groups expanded space to renegotiate their deals with the state. Uh, this can be seen in very different political arenas, including elections, development projects, etc. The Taiwanese indigenous social movement was born in the church, but it has evolved. And they continue to seek relations with the international indigenous movement. And it's part of their constant repositioning in Taiwan. But their local political movements are still informed by their own local cultural and social norms, such as the Gaya for the Durubu and Sejek people. And the indigenous social movement is still alive, perhaps more than ever. It's very dynamic, especially with new technology, social media, and so forth. But it's changing its forms and strategies in new political contexts. So we'll see what happens next year. But things are changing, and the movement is growing. So we've got lots of things to study as we move forward in indigenous relations. And so thank you all. We have half an hour for discussions. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so aside from the technology and these historical precedents, do you uh, attribute the uh, 2007 uh, United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Rights as contributing to this increased uh, you know, assertiveness of the indigenous people there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's a big effect. It's, it does have a big effect. And what's interesting is that 2005 Basic Law was inspired by draft documents of that. Um, so basically, it's Basic Law and then the 2007 Declaration. And they're all using this because they can use this as one of their pieces of evidence, if you like, if they're lobbying for certain legal change. So it's, it's very it's a very important document for that. Yes, one too. <laughs> uh, you focused on the uh, on the political uh, evolution. I'm wondering more about the political economy mm -hmm. in two forms. One uh, out migration into marriage, and the other uh, economic development of a modern sort. Mm -hmm. now, in Taiwan, modern could mean LED technology mm -hmm. and so forth. But any kind of non student agriculture, mm -hmm. non uh, hunting mm -hmm. uh, form. So, what's, what's that trend? Okay. Those two trends. Yeah, those are actually quite a number of trends. The out migration, marriage, and then political ecology. The out migration was a very big issue for quite a while. There's been an interesting trend recently of people going back to the villages. And that's because um, of rising unemployment in time. Uh, many of these people were working in labor-intensive industries, which have moved to China. And so there's been now a trend of people moving back to the village just because they don't have work elsewhere. Now, when I talked to people about that, they said, well, I was unemployed, or I didn't have a job that paid well enough, and I had to pay rent in Taipei. It's much better for me to come home where I can my family home and land and even those who don't have land, they know how to find some food in the forest, whether it's plants along the paths or other things. So there's that movement back to the village. In terms of intermarriage, there is intermarriage. I think that one of the most obvious ones is that within almost all of these villages, there are male actors of an elderly generation who marry younger Aboriginal women in the 1960s and 70s. And what's kind of interesting about those people is that they've 
generally raised their children to be indigenous. Uh, not all of them speak indigenous languages, but some of them do. They've learned to speak the local language. Uh, I think that if they're in a more remote mountain area, they're more likely to learn the language. Um, and then in terms of political ecology, in terms of where their economy is going, um, I think that what's happening is, of course, there's a big diversity. Taiwan's but small, but it's actually quite diverse in terms of how close they are to cities and so forth. Um, but there is definitely a usage of their land for agriculture. And in particularly in the high mountain areas for growing tea and cabbage. And because of the legal restrictions, and again, it, it has to do with each village is very different, but the in one of the villages that I did research with in Lushan, which is high up in Nantal, almost everybody is involved in, in the tea industry. And I had expected that the native Taiwanese, the so-called native Taiwanese who are non-indigenous, uh, would have control of the industry. But as a matter of fact, the people who live there insist that they keep the land. Uh, some of them got cheated. Um, others have learned that the best way is to simply rent out the land and take a profit from that. But others have been successful in creating tea processing factories. And so it's actually a rather wealthy indigenous village there. So there are, are different situations. And in other areas, um, like in the Taroko National Park, uh, there are villages where they would like to farm commercially, but because it's a national park, they're not. So yes, they are getting integrated into the capitalist economy. And there's not that much resistance to that. So I think Professor Simon, uh, my question is about the uh, 1993, the DPP legislators in the Jewish State of the Jewish State, they proposed that they break up the four large ethnic groups. Uh -huh. Stop solution and uh, which includes that whole thing. Mm -hmm. multiculturalism framework is that it frames it up as different ethnic groups that all have equal rights. And so it's very different from the claims that the indigenous movement is making. Because the indigenous movement claims that they're not just one ethnic group among others. They were there before the colonial period and they do have special rights. And it's not an ethnic, it's because of their structure within a colonial situation. So there is there are debates about that in Taiwan. The balance is the three largest groups, yeah. and they're all Han Chinese mm -hmm. versus the yeah. Aborigines. Uh -huh. um, you may be some people do not count as part of the Chinese nationality. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So there is that debate going on in Taiwan. Um, but the the Hakka has a council, for example, and indigenous people have a council. But there's a very big difference between those two councils, and that the indigenous people's council has, as part of their job, land. Hakka don't have to worry about the land issue. And so that land-based structural difference is what makes indigenous people different. So, uh, what uh, original land base they used to have, and the original big number one, and the categorized those? Yeah. Yeah, they're all Austronesian languages. 
They're all Austronesian oh, languages. There are 16 officially recognized groups, but within those groups there are dialectical differences. So there could be up to 60 languages. Uh, some of them are dying out. Some of them are still very much alive. Did you have their own writings? No, they write it down with Romanization. And in fact, they have Bibles, they have hymn books. The church has been a place that has kept languages in mind. You put the parable book and in the city. Uh -huh. Can you write it down in, in Chinese? Try to recognize it. Yeah. Uh, to, you said the Roman I have a parable book. Yeah. And the city, you know how to write in Chinese? Yeah. Taibuka. Taibuka. Can you, can you write? Right. Where the father is a mainlander, 
and the wife is an Aboriginal woman, that their children are the political leaders in the state system. But they all have an indigenous identity, and they all speak the language and an indigenous name. So I'd say they're, they've done a pretty good job of, one, creating a link with the state, because they are voting by the state, but two, of really kind of becoming a part of local society. Now that being said, a lot of the Aboriginal people don't like their sons to marry non-Aboriginal women. One of, one of the fascinating things that I think I see happening uh, in the kind of indigenization of Taiwan is that on the one hand you have this growing recognition of, of, of different heritages, let's put it that way for a moment. On the other hand, you have among all participants growing socio-political intimacy with each other. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Native people's politics in Taiwan is unintelligible unless you understand the politics of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So in that sense they're completely assimilated. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and maybe it's a maybe it's maybe it's a maybe it's a process going in different ways, but it seems to me that this that uh, uh, also the the earlier remark about uh, you know these mainland uh, mainland Hakka Hokkien uh, uh, ethnicity uh, that that evolves in the context of growing of growing uh, uh, cultural commonality, mm -hmm. and I would expect that that even among the Aborigines that apply, mm -hmm. growing culture, many of them. It looks just like a Taiwanese village, unless you know what's going on. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm really wondering that, that, as to, uh, is, to what extent can we, can we, can we, uh, we just take some of longer to start to do, mm -hmm. to what extent can we see this as the as, as, as development of, of autonomous uh, cultural and political rights, mm -hmm. and to what extent can we see this as, a, as an ongoing process of assimilation? Mm -hmm. I think that's the big question. Yeah. In fact, if we go back to the beginning, I mentioned Taiki Alfred. Right. And he's a Mohawk political philosopher. And he made the observation, based of course on Canada, that any type of arrangement, which is talking about constitutions and laws and legal arrangements, is a form of legal assimilation. And so, in his perspective, there has to be a return to indigenous spirituality. And that is not happening in Taiwan. So, Basically what's happening in Taiwan is that there is a political class emerging which is engaging with the political structure and asking for new systems to come into being. And then there's a whole mass of other indigenous people who are actually been alienated from that. And so there are really debates within each community about how far they should go with indigeneity. Uh, you've got the schools. I think this is an issue in, in, in this country, in Canada as well. But you've got schools which want to have more indigenous language instruction. Now, in Canada, there's some immersion programs where the whole day they speak Nikon or whatever. In Taiwan, it's only been two or three hours in the morning of language instruction. But even then, there have been indigenous families who have taken their children away from those schools and sent them outside because they want them to have better Chinese skills. They don't want them to waste time on indigenous languages. So there, there is that debate going on. And even some of the school principals and teachers who are promoting language in the school are sending their own children away. Yes? Do indigenous people routinely go to and from the mainland in the same way that non-indigenous Taiwanese do? Most of them don't have, most of them don't have the means to do so. Because they are very much, compared to the non-indigenous population, they are poor. They have higher unemployment rates. They have very lower life expectancies. So most of them are not in that position. That being said, there are some who have been able to invest in the mainland. And others, there's a, some of the politicians, of course, go all the time. All of them do, in fact. Um, so the very wealthy ones do get to go. Well, in terms of social problems, one of the things I was hit with, going to a Presbyterian uh, minister's house, and he's focused, uh -huh. and the wife is very embarrassed, is that alcoholism part of the social problem, as is 
the Native American. Mm -hmm. The um, alcoholism is the reason why Aboriginal men, Indigenous men, have life expectancies that are 20 years shorter than Indigenous. And I think that the there has to be a change in the legal framework for selling alcohol to begin with. And nobody seems to be taking this very seriously. But it's very easy to buy and sell alcohol in Taiwan. And you know, many of our reserves here are dry. It doesn't mean they can't drink, it just means that when they run out of beer, they have to drive five dollars to get up to get. I've got a related question. My impression was the K and T and in Washington tended to use the indigenous peoples against Hakka and Mi'kmaq. And is that yeah. still going on, or is it a part of a larger process? Of I think that's still going on. And I think that's what the whole multiculturalist thing is about. It's a way of using them against the potential claims of Hokkien people. And I think that the Canadians have been very good at doing that, too, especially the Trudeau period when they created the multiculturalism. And I think Taiwan's been very good today in other cases. Um, is uh, returning the land still a very big part of the political movement or social movement in our indigenous populations? Yeah, the returning our land, I think, is becoming less important in the discussions. Because? It's still there. But I, I think that they don't see the potential of actually getting back all that land, like from the national parks. Right. So, for example, when I started my research with the Tarauco, there was a big demand to get back my land I wanted the Tarauco National Park. And then that's kind of evolved into like a co-management regime. Yeah, so I think there's a recognition there that it's unlikely to get it back. Even in the indigenous community, there's been some misunderstanding about what return my land means. Because there are two types of land that we're talking about. There's the reserve land, and then there's the traditional territory. And generally, the movement people have been asking for traditional territory to be returned. And so that would be the National Parks, the Ministry of the Interior, would be the Ministry of Veteran Affairs, the Council of Veteran Affairs, because there's some military territory. Um, it would also be the Forestry Division, the Council of Agriculture, that has a lot of land. Um, but I think a lot of people in the villages, they get the impression that some people who sold their land for industrial parks and so forth. They want to get it back again. And that's not really what it's about. Return land is about not traditional right. territory. Right. Uh, was the Chinese of the original speak, is it mostly Mandarin? Or do, do some even speak like Hokkien or Hakka? Yeah, it's mostly Mandarin. But people who work every day with Hokkien people do speak Taiwanese. And they speak it quite well. <laughs> so quite often, you know, when I'm there in the village, and with people who speak three or four languages interchanging with you, switching back and forth all the time. They're much less likely to learn Hakka. Yeah. I gather your, your, your remark about, your remark about multiculturalism, uh, the issue of uh, some kind of uh, cultural autonomy is not exactly the same thing as an economic issue of poverty. Uh -huh. yeah. And so I wonder what it, to what extent uh, you see it does is this policy orientation in Taiwan today with respect, with respect to poverty uh -huh. alleviation. If you're thinking about it, endlessly from poverty alleviation, uh, affirmative action, things along the line that, that, that are geared uh, in terms of uh, the uh, Taiwan's total economic growth, uh -huh. and where these people fit into it. Yeah, in terms of poverty reduction, the indigenous movement doesn't address that. Exactly. And Mikhail Rudolph, who's a German anthropologist who's been working on this, draws attention to the fact that there's a division between the elites and the common people. And I think he's absolutely right about that. Yeah. And that the elites come up with all of these utopian ideas about autonomous regions and state-to-state -state relations, nation to nation, but they're not really dealing with issues that uh, many people are dealing with of having to feed their families. Um, some of them are very poor. You know, I think they're too busy being elites. Yeah. yeah. And some of them have trouble feeding their families. Some of them have serious medical issues. Um, 
So there are very serious economic questions that are there, and the indigenous movement doesn't deal with that. So many of the ordinary people, to see these elites is just trying to create bureaucratic positions for themselves and enrich themselves. And I think that's part of why that they continue to vote for the KMT, because they think that the the rate of the state will protect them. But here's, here's exactly the context in which the distinction you draw a very important count of peoples and people uh -huh. comes into full play. Yeah. When you're talking about poverty, you're not talking about peoples, you're talking about people. people. Yeah. And, 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 and the more you talk about peoples, the better it is in many respects of uh -huh. In terms of these issues, it may be yeah. going in a somewhat yeah. uh, awry direction. Yeah. The one group that is really dealing with poverty reduction in Taiwan is World Vision. And they have no interest in the indigenous rights movement. But they are indigenous people who are raising funds and trying to help the most needy among the needy of indigenous people. It's a, I mean, it's a Christian group. You know, you know, to... So the, the, the points we, we hope you all understand is that some of the distinctions that we're making yeah. today are, 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 are very deep. And they penetrate into the depths of Taiwan society. I mean, they're, they're right in there. Is very important. And I, is there any other questions? Well, the hour is upon us, and I want to I thank you again for a very uh, informative and most stimulating uh, afternoon. Thank you so much.